believers and proclaiming to a lost and dying word that he is the hope of salvation and eternal life. Today, hope is risen. Second chances are risen. Even the peace that we've always longed for but have never truly known is risen. Because today, we celebrate that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ has risen. Lift up his name. 
he is risen indeed. God, we thank you for your great love. You who are rich in mercy have made us alive in Christ. It is by your grace that we are saved. The scene unfolded, the fall began. A desperate people, a darkened land, a broken world, the sin of man. The Father's answer, a perfect lie to pay our ransom, the highest price, a rugged cross.
Only the God of the impossible could have made a way for both his justice and his mercy to be satisfied. Only he could make a place where both his love and his wrath could be poured out freely. It was impossible for all of us who are guilty in our sin to be, to be restored back to the Father and his family. But God made the impossible once and forever possible at the cross. and sacred hill where violence purchased peace. The innocent was bound to set the captive free. There you made a way the wellster welcomed home again. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross, and thank you for inviting those who are weary to come and lay our burdens down at the foot of the cross. For it is at the cross 
that we are reminded that by your death, our debt was paid. And through the power of the resurrection, you are raised to life for our justification. Thank you, God, for the cross. Sing with us. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God is spent at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. As salvation's story was being written and God's plan was unfolding, Christ Jesus took on the nature of a servant and humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Yeah. 
Jesus is the name above all names. And as we worship him this morning, we're going to invite you to stand with us now. And let's worship him together.
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed We've come here today to honor God, to lift up our Savior Jesus Christ and to worship Him. And in this place there may be those of us who have burdens on our hearts, have things that are happening in our life. Jesus came to rescue us sinners, all of us, and to ransom us. Won't you allow Him? to rescue your heart today.
tomorrow in your hand and hope is in my heart again the chains of fear fell at my feet on is no curses hold on me say goodbye no more and only death will pass away gone are the tears of yesterday Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloak and, and, and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Next week is Easter. That means this week is Palm Sunday. Many of you know what that is. Some of you might not know. That's the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. What's important to think about, though, is Jesus was entering in. He wasn't just entering into Jerusalem. He wasn't just coming to, to teach. He was coming to end his life. 
These were his very last days. This was his last time to come into Jerusalem. And imagine everyone was cheering and shouting. And it's Hosanna. And they were celebrating. And they were cutting the branches, the palm leaves. Get it? Palm Sunday. And they were putting those down. And it was a big celebration. Yet as he rode in, he knew what had to be done. As he rode in, he knew what was going to happen. He knew how the week was going to play out. He also knew that during this last week, he was going to share some of the most important teachings that he could give. If I were to tell one of you that, hey, you got this week, it's all you got left, there's probably some wisdom that you would want to pass on, some last things you would make sure that you could share with others, and that's exactly what Jesus meant to do as he came into Jerusalem for his last week here on earth as a mortal man only, that he was going to share his last things. Now, as he came in, he knew what was going to happen. He had to die. See, up until this point, into Jesus' uh, death, we had a sacrificial system. You guys remember this? That in, in the Old Testament, and even in Jesus' time, we understood that sin required blood. Every single time. In the Garden of Eden, when it happened, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what did they do? They tried to hide their nakedness, their sin, with a leaf. That didn't work. That wasn't enough. God had to kill an animal, take their hides to cover their sin. And so from the fall of man, the first time they messed up until now, blood was required to cover sin every single time. So a sacrificial system was put into place where they would come to the temple and, and you would offer up a sacrifice for your sins. And, and it got to be a pretty, pretty hectic system. Imagine a world where you had to keep track of every single sin that you did and then make atonement by kind of figuring out, all right, I need three pigeons, a sheep, Maybe a dove, I'll figure it out. And you got up there. And you had to offer sacrifice, or a priest had to offer sacrifice for you for your sins to atone. This system grew larger and larger, and, and I'll be honest, the system wasn't working anymore. And it's not because God messed up. It's not because God set up a system that didn't work. It was because we got involved, because mankind got involved, and we messed up that system. And so God knew, all along he knew, that there was something else that had to be done, a different plan, something more than just the sacrifice of animals to cover up sin. In 2 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter 5, verse 14, it says this, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. That one has died for all. Jesus died for all. He was the ultimate sacrifice. You may ask yourself, well, was it that bad? Are we that bad that we couldn't take care of our own anymore? We couldn't offer sacrifice animals enough anymore? The answer is yes, we are that bad. It is easy to come into a church and to look around and see people. It's easy to look around at people in our church and other churches and say, man, you know, they've got it together. You can look at a husband and wife and look at them and think, man, they're, they're doing good. Look at them in church. You see them in the community. I bet they don't even fight. I bet they love each other. And he never says anything mean. He never forgets a date, and she never gets onto him and nags and all that kind of stuff. It's easy to look at a young family and look at their kids and go, wow, look how well-behaved their kids are. I wish mine were like that. It's easy to look at all those things and look at the world around us and look at the people that we see and think, oh, man, they've got it together. I wish that I could be together like that. Here's the reality. We are all broken. We are all messed up. All of our kids fight. All of our grandkids fight. No one's perfect, not one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin, if you don't know, means missing the mark. Sin means you mess up. You make mistakes. We all do that. And because that all of you do that, and I do that, and even the choir does that, all of us, as much as we mess up, because of that, sacrifice of animals wasn't enough anymore. We needed one to die for all, and that was Jesus Christ. We needed Jesus, Jesus Christ righteousness. It's not a word we use a lot, is it? Think about the last time you've used the word righteousness, not in church. Probably not many of you. Unless you're a surfer, you probably don't say, that's righteous, dude. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It, it. Think about the last 20 years. Have any of you used the word righteous or righteousness or any of that kind of word in any context? I have never. I'm from Texas, born and raised. And that's not something we say. You don't get on the back of a horse and go, that's one righteous horse. You don't, 
It's just not what we do. Now, I know some people from California, and they may say that word and use that word. It's a word that we understand, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a churchy word. Now, we didn't make it up. It's in the Bible. It's a very valuable word. It means this, if you don't know, to be in right standing with God. It means that I am right. I can stand before God, and I am everything's taken care of. Imagine scales. Imagine two sets of scales. One, here's every time you did something wrong, here's every time you did something right. And you're trying to balance those things out. You're trying to make up for everything you did wrong. How many of you think you could do that? How many of you think at the end of the day you could go, all right, you know, I hid from this one person in Walmart. I saw him coming down the aisle, but I want to talk to him. So, I, you know, I hid away. I honked at this person and thought some really bad thoughts about him on Main Street because they were walking across, and I just wanted to hit them, silly jaywalkers. You know what I'm talking about. I've experienced, I've only been here a month, and I've already, come on. What if at the end of the day, you had to mount up every single thing you did wrong that day? Every single thing that you had a bad thought? I don't mean you just did, but those thoughts, you know the thoughts. Those thoughts you had about your neighbor, that person on the street, a co-worker, a father, a mother, a son, a grandson, a husband, a wife. Any of those thoughts you had and things you acted on, didn't act on, any time it turned to sin. What if you had at the end of the day go, okay, I have to do this to make up for all that I did? Let me just tell you. I don't think I could do it. I know I couldn't do it. I know there's no way that I could get right with God in all those things. But because Jesus came to die, I don't have to. He took those scales that I'm trying to balance in my life and make sure that I'm good enough, and he just knocked them over. He said, I am enough. His death was enough for you and me. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, says this. All this is from God whom through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Reconciliation, reconciled, that's another R word we don't use a lot. That one you may use more often. You reconcile your bank account or your checkbook. The same idea of God's right, or Christ's righteousness, that we need to be reconciled before him. And the beautiful picture is, is that Jesus stands before the Lord and says, I will reconcile their account. I have paid the debt for Tommy Russell. I have paid the debt for all of you. I have reconciled their account. For some of you today, you've heard some of the songs beautiful songs. If you've paid attention to the words, you see it's talking about salvation. Salvation is becoming a Christian. Every different church has a different way of putting it over the years. We say, get saved. Or we say, become a Christian, a Christ follower. It all means the same thing. It's somewhere you made a decision that said, I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I'm tired of trying to figure out these scales. I understand that I am not good enough. I want Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. The Bible simply says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you did that somewhere, somewhere in your life, then you are now saved. You now have salvation. You now are a Christian, a Christ follower. Welcome. You're part of our team. I'm glad you're here. If you didn't do that, you need to. There's no test because you can't do it on your own. We are not good enough. We messed the scales up, remember? Jesus came so that you could be reconciled. He came so that his righteousness, because he's perfect, can be put on you. And you can maybe be perfect before God, becoming right standing before him. So in a little bit, we're going to have an invitation where that some of you might need to talk to me about this. Some of you where you're at, you might need to pray. You might be time that you stop trying to do it on your own and you become reconciled. Some of you, it's been a long time. You've walked with God for a while. Some of you are just visiting this morning, hanging out because someone's singing, and you're here to check it out. It is never too late, young or old, to be reconciled. Now, the rest of you, though, the rest of you, what did it say there that we're supposed to be? Oh, yeah, ambassadors. We are to be representatives of Jesus Christ. This morning, the title of the musical is Salvation Story. Do you know what that means? means that if you became a Christian, you walked down this aisle or some aisle like this, and you prayed with a pastor, and you were crying, and you had snot bubbles, and you felt the spirit moving in you, 
you were at a camp, a vacation Bible school, you were in your living room somewhere, if you made that decision and you became a Christian, you joined Team Jesus, you're part of our team, now you get to be an ambassador. And you get a story. You have a salvation story. You have a story to share with other people. And your story is unique to you. It's your story. It's what God has done for you. It's what Jesus Christ means to you. And you don't have to be a pastor to do that. That's not my job. It's your story. I have my own story. And it's different than your story. You don't want my story. You just want how it ended. I became a Christian. And that is what is so valuable that Christ has given to you. As you have been made right with Christ or with God and you've been reconciled and you have his righteousness, you now have a story. Well, if you have a story, what are you supposed to do with a story? Tell it. Tell your story. It is your job as a Christian to tell your story. You don't get to retire from that. Did you know that? It doesn't matter how old you are. You don't, have, you don't get to stop telling your story. It is your story that Jesus has entrusted to you, and you are to share it. Next week is Easter. Next week is the easiest weekend in the entire year to get someone to church. I mean, it's the no-brainer. Everyone will go to church next time. Everyone will go, yeah, I'll go. They get a long weekend, they're off, they get Good Friday, maybe, they have all this time. And so it's one of those where you can say, look, you get an extra day on Friday off, come to church Sunday. Moms, grandmas, you can guilt them, and they will come to church. Do it. Pray, and then guilt them. Just go ahead, it's okay. Because if they're not here, they can't, they can't hear it. And so, yeah, it's the big Sunday. It's when we can bring people in, and we can have a lot of crowd. Every church in America will have tons of people, and that is great. But you know what's more important than you inviting them to church? Is you telling your story to them. Your story. Your unique salvation story. Your story is, here's what I used to be. Here's what I used to look like. And then I met Jesus. And now, this is who I am. I'm not perfect, because only Jesus is. But this is who I am now. Here's what Christ has done for me in my life. Now, this is not three hours. story. Some of you, Jesus has done a lot. And you can tell me hours and hours of every story he's done for you. This is more of your overview of everything God has done for me. Here's what he's done for me recently kind of thing. Here's my challenge to you that are Christians. You're part of Team Jesus and we'll be done. I want you during this next song and as the rest of the day goes, I want you to ask God, God, give me four people to share my story with this week. Four. It's a very specific number and it means nothing. I just came up with four because it looks fun to hold up four. (laughs) Easier than five, more than three. Four. Four people. Some of you would say, well, all my friends are Christians. We'll meet some new people this week. Four people that you can share your salvation story with. Four people that get to hear about what Jesus has done for you so that they're ready for Easter. So they're ready for the empty tomb. They're ready to know that our Lord is risen. It's more than a song. It's more than a a picture. It's more than any display we can do. It is a story. It's true. It happened. You share that. And if you're scared what to say, it's okay. It's your story. I can't tell you what to say. It's yours. But pray, God, for people this week. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a child, grandson, great-grandson. Maybe it's your parents. Do you know I did that? I had to share with my parents. Someone has to. Maybe it's a neighbor that you're not sure about. Maybe it's that person you'd rather hit when they're jaywalking. Instead, you need to park and talk to them. Maybe it's a store owner. Maybe it's your barber. Maybe it's your banker. I don't know. God knows, though, and that's what I want to challenge you to. You pray. Because you are an ambassador. You've been reconciled. You've been given Jesus' righteousness. And because of that, you have an obligation, a duty, the responsibility to go and share your story. We're going to have an invitation now. It's a little different this morning, like I said. If you're being baptized this morning, that's your cue. You can get up and leave. We're not going to look at you. Well, I'm looking at you all. Because not very many people are getting up. So (laughs) we have a lot to need to get up. So go ahead and get up and start moving. For the rest of us, though, If you have never become a Christian, if you have fought your whole life trying to be good enough, you thought maybe if I go to church, that'll help. Maybe if I'm nice to my neighbors, maybe if I throw an extra $20 bill in the offering plate, which you can do, we would take it. Uh, Maybe if I do that, (laughs) I'll be good enough. Well, you can't be. You can't be good enough. Because Jesus didn't die for people just to be good enough. He died for us to be reconciled. 
And so I want to offer an opportunity for you this morning to pray where you are, to come with me. I'll lead you in a prayer in a second. For everyone else, you can join the church this morning if you want to. It's a special morning. You're more than welcome to join. We'd love to have you here. Just it'll be a little different. You can do that during the invitation. For the rest of you, though, all of you in here that have walked with Jesus, you don't remember what life was like before being a Christian. This is your opportunity, your time to pray, to ask God, God, what are the four people? Give me the names for people. Maybe you need to write them down. Pull out that card. Write them down in there so you have them. But four names. I'm not asking you to save the whole county. I just want you to share with four people your Jesus story. If you want to invite them back to church or to a church, that's fine. Four people. All of you can do it. Four people that you can share with. You can pray about it. God will tell you. You can come down here and kneel at the altar and pray and ask God to reveal those to you because I can guarantee you this. God already has four people for you. I know he does. He's probably got more. We just don't listen because some of us are a little scared of doing that. But we could share the story. I know some of your stories, and they are amazing. I've prayed with some of you. I've visited some of you in the hospital. I've been to your houses, and I know you have amazing stories. All of you do because it's your story that Jesus gave to you. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those in the room. I pray for those that don't know you, that this morning they won't waste one more second trying to do it on their own. Not one more, but this morning, Father, they would choose to follow you. If that is you, pray this prayer. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up. I'm broken. I'm imperfect. I make mistakes. I know I'm not good enough. I desperately need help. I need you, Jesus. I believe that you died on a cross. I believe that you rose again. And I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Please, I need you, Jesus. And for everyone else in the room, Father, that they need you to help them figure out what are the four. What are the four people that they can share their story with? I pray and I ask, God, that during this time of worship, during this week, Lord, as they, they encounter people, that you help us to remember the very story you gave us, the change you gave us. Help us to be bold and not afraid, but to go out and share what you have done for us. I pray for our friends, our family, our visitors that are here this morning that we can hear from you. I ask this your holy and righteous name. Amen. Would you please stand? Let's stand together. If you have a decision to make this morning, won't you do it now? You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all, seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all, Jesus. It's a little off, so we probably you guys didn't know. We're going to go ahead and take our offering now. So if you'll come forward. <coughs> Who's everybody coming? We threw them off. See that? Come on up. <coughs> Please bow with me as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunities we have to, to worship in this house today, in your house. We thank you for the blessings that you give us, those we know about and those we don't know about. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son and our Savior. As we come now to return a portion of
those blessings to you. May they be used for further to your kingdom here on earth. In your name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, I praise you that by your grace, my sins are gone, and I can rest on your unfailing love. Thank you, Lord. Romans 8.38 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's higher than the mountains that I face, and it's stronger than the power of the grave, and constant in the trial and the change. This one, this one thing remains. Sing it with us. It's higher than the mountains that I face, and it's stronger than the power of the grave, and constant in the trial and the change. This one thing. This one thing remains. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. And on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be afraid. This one thing remains. This one thing remains. Your love never fails and 
never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. And on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never ever have to be. It never runs out on me. And your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Your love. people said amen his love is never ending <laughs> amen yeah sorry about that I wouldn't know where to go and not it's my first time baptism the first of many here that we're gonna have okay uh, <laughs> here's the thing guys you know, baptism, I, I've already talked to all the people being baptized this morning and made sure they understand what's happening, and I, make I want to make sure everyone understands. Baptism doesn't do anything, really. It's not that it makes them super Christian. It's not like they're going to float up out of the water and, and a dove descend upon them. If it did, that would be really, really neat. Um, but it's not going to happen, most likely. Baptism, as many of you know, and they have already expressed to me, is an outward example of what you've already done in your heart. And each one of these people have made a profession of faith as Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And they want to follow that up with baptism. Some to join the church, some just because they're Christians. And they want everyone to know they're a Christian. Baptism is a time of celebration. It's, it's not really meant to be a solemn, like, oh, we're baptized. It is meant to be an amazing thing, a celebration. What does the Bible say that when a person accepts Christ, the angels celebrate? Well, this is our celebration, our party, that when people get baptized, they are part of our family. And so each time when a person is baptized, each single one, if you know their name, shout their name. Clap for them, cheer for them, don't hold back. We cheer for football teams, basketball teams. We cheer for a lot of things out there. There is nothing more worthy than cheering for someone that is being obedient to Jesus Christ and being baptized. And so don't sit there and think, I can't make a sound. Make a sound. You have my permission. No one's going to get mad at you. If they do, send them to me, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to them about it. Don't worry about that. So first up, we have Charlie. Charlie, come on down. Charlie, don't fall. Now, Charlie has a vested interest in this baptism because it's his job to kind of make sure this thing's up and running and not leaking. <laughs> and I want you to know, this water is warm. It's like a, it feels good. If he wasn't being baptized, it might not have been. I don't know. No. Charlie loves the Lord. Charlie is a Christian. He's told me he is. 
we, we've talked about it. He loves Christ. And he's the one behind the scenes doing all kinds of work in the church. He fixes everything that I break, that everyone else breaks. And this morning, he wants to be baptized. So, Charlie, go ahead. In obedience, command our Father, and upon your profession and faith in him as our Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stand up. You're good. You're good. Dennis? All right, don't fall, Dennis. Now, Dennis, Dennis. go around this. There you go. Now, sit down. There you go. Perfect. Get comfy. It's warm, isn't it? Good. Feels good. It's like a bath. I want you to know we've got these nice blue lights on us. You know who did that? This guy right here. He found out he was going to be baptized, and, and he said he wanted to make sure these lights were working so you could see them. So he came up here of his own time and fixed them. But Dennis has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. He knelt with me in my office. He knows without a doubt that Jesus is his Lord and Savior. And so I'm going to baptize you, Dennis. Go ahead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! There we go. Stand on up. You're good. Go ahead. What's that? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Dennis wants to say something. Go ahead, Dennis. Amen. Amen. Now we are blessed we've got a family to baptize. Mom's already been. So now we got dad. We got Steve and I. I've talked to him and both of his children. And, and go ahead and sit down right there. There you go. It's comfy. Feels good, doesn't it? See? Now he's he's kind of lounging back. <laughs> he knows that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And Stephen has come before to be baptized in front of our church. So go ahead, here we go. In obedience to the command of our Father, and upon your profession of faith in Him as Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Woo! There you go. Thank you, sir. You want to stay and watch? Please, go ahead. I just want to say Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords and my Savior, and graciously and mercifully Savior of all those. Amen. Thank you, sir. And we've got his daughter. Amy is going to come down. You okay? It's good. Come on. It's warm. I promise. Come on around there. All right, Amy. Go ahead and sit down. I've asked Amy as well if she knows Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. She told me she does. She knows him well. And she's come to be baptized and be a part of our family. So, Amy, in obedience to the command of our Father, and upon your profession and faith in him, as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on down. Charles. Do you go by Charles? Yeah, Charles. Go by Charlie. Charles. Charles. We're right out of Charlie. We've got Charles here. I'm sorry we have to mess this hair up, man. It looks good, but we're going to mess it up. Now, now, Charles has also told me that he's accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he wants to be baptized today, and we're excited to do that. So go ahead. In obedience, command our Father, and upon your profession and faith in him as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Come on up. Yep. Come on down. Now we got a special treat. This is Jeff, and these are his daughters, Emily and uh, Alexis, or Lexi. No, it's okay. You good? He's getting it worked out. He's getting it worked out. He's going to baptize. He's had that privilege of baptizing his other children before. And, and, you know, here's what I'll tell you. When Jesus said to go and baptize, he didn't say pastors baptize. He said go and baptize. And so we get to baptize. The most special time of my life is when I got to baptize my own son. And so I've talked to Jeff. I've talked to his daughters. And all of them are excited about being here today. And I've talked to each one. And they've told me they've accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior without a doubt. And they want to be baptized today. So he's going to be the dun do the dunking. I'm going to do the talking. Okay? Here we go. Emily, I, or I, am having you baptized in obedience to your Father upon your profession and faith in him as your Lord and Savior. We baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what? Awesome. 
awesome. Come on down. She's got her camo on to be baptized. I like it. Nothing wrong with that. There you go. And this is Lexi, and I have also asked her if she knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior, and she told me she does. And so we want to baptize today. Her father gets to baptize her as well. So we're going to baptize you in obedience command your father, in your profession of faith in Jesus, your Lord and Savior. We're going to baptize you, my sister, in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Very good. Very good. Get them wet. Get them real wet. There you go. I'm so glad and honored that we got to baptize today. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Baptism is truly an amazing thing we get to do. And we hope to do it more and more and more and more. And remember, it was a celebration. It was amazing. It felt good to them. And I'm so excited to see the Spirit of God move in our church. I hope you are. Um, we've got something else. Garrett, take over. I just want to remind you, next week is our Easter service. I hope to see you all back. We've added a second service for everyone. So they can be here at 745 in the morning. For some of you, you hear that and you go, yeah, I get to have church, eat, and beat everybody to the restaurants. So you be here for that. Some of you are thinking, like my wife, no, not, not going to make it to 745. That's why we have it. If you want to, you make it to that early service. We'd love to have you. It's not going to be church many. It's going to be exactly the same as the second service. We will have the word of God. We're going to have music. And we're going to celebrate our Savior being risen from the dead. So let me pray for you guys and hand it over to uh, Gary and the choir. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be here. I thank you, God, that we get to celebrate through songs. I thank you we get to celebrate through offering of money. I thank you we get to celebrate through baptism. I pray, Father, this week, show us the four that we get to share our story with. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Let's go and share the love of Jesus.